Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emanuel, I'm an airline pilot and today I'm going to give you a little introduction into London Stansted Airport. So back in the day when I flew the Boeing 737 I flew in the Stansted a lot and today I want to share my knowledge of the local procedures with you so that you can get the most out of your approaches to Stansted. Alright, follow me into the cockpit and then we start having a look. And basically this is where things get interesting. So, we'll start with the general preparation of our approach. And we are going to come in via the TOSVA-1 Alpha arrival, which is what we mostly used in um, the routes that I flew to off Stansted. So let's have a look into what that looks like and what there is that is interesting for you. So, this is the TOSVA-1 Alpha arrival, and that is valid for both runways 22 and 04. Now, runway 22 is mostly in use in Stansted. I tend to say that 9 out of 10 approaches to that airport were towards runway 22. We've got some descent planning tables over here, which basically list the same restrictions as we have in the star. But there is something interesting that we need to take care of, and that is that this Abbott at flight level 80 restriction. The first thing before we start that, though, Coming in via Tosva, we would normally overfly the waypoint Kegit, as you can see on our navigation display right over here. And by Kegit, ATC would usually want you to be at flight level 280 or below. So for that reason, I will enter Kegit 280 or below, so that we get an accurate topper descent. It does happen, however, that they send you direct towards Idesi before you actually start the descent, and then you need to coordinate with air traffic control if they wanted to leave and cross Kaget Abeam flight level 280 or not. So, no descent path after Abbott. That is something that you can expect to see a lot. And unable to 50 at Lapra happens as well, at least if you're flying Ryanair and thus your cost index gives you a speed of 245 in the descent. You can make it a 250 below 100 restriction, but that one over here you can always change because it says maximum speed 250 at Lapra. So if you go ahead and look at that, then we can see over here at Lapra 250, we change that into 250 or below, and then this problem is solved. Okay, however, there is another problem we need to solve, and that is going to be applicable for pretty much all approaches. And that is our flight level 80 restriction at Abbott. As you can see, runway 22 is just over here, and Abbott is only some 15 nautical miles out. So flight level 80 is much too high for straight in approach. However, if you have a look into the initial approach chart, then you will see that actually Abbott does not have the level 80 restriction, but that actually only applies for the holding at Abbott. So since we normally are not going to fly the hold, we can remove that from the flight plan, and then we can simply change the restriction into flight level 80 or below, and that all of a sudden is going to give you a much better descent path. Here you can see it, 80 below, execute that, and that is what we would normally do flying in the stand set. Because now, you can see from Abbott over here, we can quickly join the um, 4000 feet by 16 and a half miles to Barkway. Now this being stanced, obviously we are going to get radar vectors, as is the case in all of the UK. And typically those radar vectors are going to be approximately straight over the magenta line. So, if we keep all of that stuff in our FMC, we just about got to be careful that we do not accidentally turn while we are on a heading, even though our route line might be switching. So, the other thing we need to be aware of is getting our weather. Now, Stansted has the same ATIS frequency as Münster Osnabrück. And since we are coming about from over at Germany over here, as we can basically see on the chart over here, Münster is just about here, Stansted is just about here, so you can see that right now we are actually closer to Münster than we are to Stansted, and Münster got the stronger transmitter. For that reason, we are going to receive the Münster ATIS over the Stansted ATIS, and Stansted is basically going to be unrecognizable. But as you can see, there's a backup, which is the... Um, 114.55 frequency, which is basically Clacton VOR, and if you listen to the voice item of Clacton, then you're going to get the ATIS for Stansted. So, for that reason, we would go ahead, 114.55, set that active, 
and as soon as you actually receive the um, VOR, which you will do pretty early, because Clacton is actually located right on the shore, round about somewhere over here, so that's quite a bit ahead of the airport. As soon as you re receive the ATIS, uh, sorry, as soon as you receive the Clacton VOR, you can turn on the um, nav receiver over here, and then you can listen to the Stansted ATIS on your way, even though you could not listen to it on the voice radio yet. Neat little trick there to get your weather information earlier, especially since this is the UK, so you will often have low visibility procedures in use. Okay, that is basically our preparation for the approach. There is one more thing that I want to talk about, and that is the requirement to execute continuous descent approaches. In Stansted, they are really after those CDAs, so you got to make sure that you do not have to level off below 10,000 feet, at least that was my airline's requirement, even though the legal requirement says that you can fly level for a maximum of 2.5 nautical miles in order to meet your CDA criteria. All right then, let's jump forward a little bit and have a look into what air traffic control is usually going to do. We are now inbound to Kegit and approaching our top of descent for the level 280 restriction. At this point, Maastricht radar would usually tell you to descend to flight level 280 reached by Kegit, and in some cases they say when ready, in other cases they don't. If they don't, you just start your descent, but if they say when ready to start your descent, you would basically go ahead and prepare your MCP and make sure you have the restriction in your FMC. But before you actually leave your flight level, they would hand you off to London radar. And when you talk to London, they might just about lift that restriction again, or you can even ask London if they really need you at flight level 280 at Kaget. And more often than not, London would usually lift that restriction, provided there is enough space on the frequency that you actually get to talk to them. So, normally, at this point they would send you direct towards either Tosvar or Idisi, depending on the amount of traffic and depending on the arrivals into the other London airports. Keep in mind that the main arrivals towards Heathrow and Luton also go through this area, so there is a lot happening and it is a very complex airspace. However, whenever ATC has the capabilities, they are going to give you a direct and, for example, today we might be sent direct to Tosva. Now, we're going to take Tosva on top, but provided that ATC does not lift our descent restriction, beam Kegit, that means we have to take our beam points and have to take the Kaget restriction 280 below, and then we can always do this, so that we actually keep our restriction. Okay, and that basically prepares us for the descent. Our airplane is slowed down to its target descent speed of 245, which is typical for Ryanair for the descents, and then we are going to leave our cruising level very shortly. Now, here is something more that we need to focus on, and that warrants another look into the charts and into what the plan is. So, Stansted is a very, very, very busy airport. And that usually means that we have high-intensity runway operations in use. In other words, there might be traffic two and a half miles behind you on the approach, or there might just be traffic three miles behind you, and they try to get an airplane out in between. So, that means you need to vacate the runway as quickly as possible. And for any medium-sized aircraft, like the 737 or A320, ATC expects you to vacate the runway at November Romeo. Otherwise, the separation they use and the traffic density is just not going to work out. For that reason, November Romeo, 1450 meters of runway available, is going to be your exit in question. Now, as you can figure, 1400 meters really isn't that much. For that reason, we are going to use flaps 40, and depending on the results of our performance tool, we might either use auto break 3 or even go for auto break max. On top of that, we have to keep in mind that if we simply look at the airport layout, we will quickly figure that if all those aircraft vacate November Romeo and then taxi to the stand, you always save all this additional area over here that aircraft would be taxi. If you are an airline like Ryanair and you have so many thousands of flights in a standstill 
every week, then saving the, that taxi time is certainly going to be interesting and appealing for you. Alright, next descent clearance, usually flight level 220, and what could happen as well is they send you directly to Idyssey, but they want you to reach 220 15 miles before Idyssey. Now this is how we would do that. So we go directly to Idyssey, and execute that, and then ATC tells you to reach flight level 220 15 miles before Idyssey. So what you do now is you take Idyssey slash minus 15, and then you insert flight level 220 or below in there. Usually it's going to give you something just above that, between level 220 and level 230, so the restriction actually isn't too bad for us. But this is normally what things would turn into, and how we would fly this. Right, let's move a little bit further forward, and then I'm going to get you into the particulars of the approach runway to 2. We've just about passed the 15 mile point prior to Idyssey, and we are intercepting our descent was level 180 at Idyssey. Now, you will see that I've accelerated a little bit. The reason for that is that usually a traffic control is going to give you a speed restriction, because round about at this point, the arrivals of Heathrow and Stansted are merging. And it is very common to get speed restrictions in the region of about 280 to 300 knots when overflying these points. Also, once you're past 15 miles prior to sea, you're going to get your hand off to the next London controller, which is going to give you some expectations for your arrival. Now, that is usually going to be a direct if the traffic situation permits, or it is going to be information about possible delay, maybe including a speed reduction. So, we're in Mount Idyssey at the moment, and what I experience most of my times flying in the Stansted, at least off the peak inbound period, so if there is no inbound rush, then we usually got a direct towards Abbott. At the same time, they however want you to cross a beam flight level 180, a beam Idyssey, so what you would do is this, go to vertical speed, and then you get your direct towards Abbott, you can put that in, and often what you should do is to ask them if they want you to cross flight level 120, a beam Lapra. Now, some pilots say you don't need to ask them, they need to tell you, and if the frequency is busy, that is certainly also the way I would do it. However, it is always a good idea just to check on that, because it can get quite nasty if they expect you below level 120 at Lapra, but you don't want to do it because Lapra is no longer on, along your route. So that is quite common in Stamstead. Now we're in Mount Abbott, and now things are going to get interesting. The airspace profile around that airport is quite interesting. So. Basically, we are expecting a very steep descent. Initially, we might get clearance down to flight level 120, that is normally what you get, and you're going to follow that profile, but by the time you approach flight level 100, things are going to get interesting. And why is that? Basically because you will be held high, and at the end we'll have to do a pretty steep descent, but at the same point in time, they are typically expecting a continuous descent when you're going towards Romwe 22. On Romwe 04 things look different, but that's going to be for later in this video. So for now, we'll continue towards Romwe 22. We'll continue along the descent profile, because this is still our optimum profile, but ATC is very soon going to give us some lovely situation, bringing us into a situation where we have to manage our energy really carefully. We are on the brink of approaching flight level 100. Now this is where we are going to start our speed reduction and shortly thereafter ATC will start keeping us high. If we have another look into the charts we can easily see why and here's the reason. We've got the uh, Clacton departures and a lot of other departures going into this direction which basically until 25 miles out is limited to 6000 feet and then all the way to Clacton at 6000. So they will try to keep you above this and for that reason, you will be kept high. Now, here's typically what ATC would do. Normally, you will go somewhere between two and 3,000 feet high on profile as you're approaching Abbott. That is still below the flight level 80 over here, 
but that is roughly what you can expect. Also at this point you would usually get on to radar vectors, so we can go heading select and start our stuff from here. Now if we're going heading, let's take full control of the plane, so let's also go into level change over here. And now ATC is going to give you step descents by about a thousand feet each time. So from level 100 you would probably get a descent to 9000 feet and then later on we're going to get 8000, 7000 and so on. So I'm just about to um, do the 10 checks over here and once those are done well, let's have a look into how things are going to work out. Okay, that uh, 10 checks completed and now things are going to get interesting. So, you can see we start getting high on a profile. At the same point in time, because Stansted is such a busy airport, air traffic control is going to keep us on the speed restriction over here. So, now there is really nothing we can do. We have to keep the continuous descent. For that reason, I'm not just plummeting down to 9000, but keeping my plane high doing just about 500 feet a minute over here. 500 feet a minute is the minimum you should do, otherwise you should notify ATC that you are descending slower. So that way around ATC is going to keep us under control. Normally what I would do once we are on radar vectors is I take Abbott out of the flight plan and just give me a direct to the 10 mile final which is the Charlie Fox point over here. So Charlie Fox is in. Also, at this point, in order to get the most accurate VNAV profile, I know that ATC will ask 165 knots until 4 DME. So for that reason, I'm just putting in 165 at the um, final approach point. So now you can see we start getting high, and we will get higher. Eventually they clear down to 8000 feet, and now it comes down to energy management. I'm increasing my rate of descent here to 1000 feet a minute, so that we get down as low as we can, but then again, we need to avoid having to level off. So that makes the game in the standstill a little bit more fun over here. We can see right now we've got 19 miles, so here's how you can do a quick press check of your altitudes. We can see we've got 19 miles to the center fix, and if we can look on the ND, we'll see that we've got like 15, yeah, 18 miles to the 10 mile final, so 28 miles. So the VNAV over here showing us that we're high is actually accurate. At some point in the descent they typically give you speed restriction of 220 and then things get even more interesting. Typically 220 and flight level 60 or altitude 6000. So let's go to local Q&H. If you've got a lower than standard Q&H things get a little bit easier for you. If you've got a higher than standard Q&H you might be even higher on profile. So now that we are cleared down by 2000 feet, we can definitely take up the speed brake and start our descent. Because now we've got to use our energy as we can in order to get the airplane down. This is a typical site, you will be above the glide slope as you're approaching Dunstead. Now that is something that is absolutely to be expected. And at the same time, while all of this is happening, you also need to still do your first checks, approach checks and so on. So now we've basically given the airplane everything we can. We could extend the flaps, but I would wait a little bit with that. So let's quickly do the first check. We've got frequencies of 110.5, that's active in Nav 1 and Nav 2. Also we can quickly um, pre-select the uh, Barkway VR for the missed approach here. Fixed rings around runway 22, 10 miles, 4 miles, island, India Sierra X-ray, India Sierra X-ray, standby instruments, set and the courses, 2, 2, 2, set, approach checklist. We've got ultimate instruments, set cross check, approach rates, track and set, approach checks complete. Okay, one to go, speed break can go in, and now things are basically getting funny, because we are really high at the moment. 18 miles out, six and a half thousand feet. Typically by this point they clear you down to 4,000 feet and once they do that you really got to get those flaps out in order to get the drag and get your airplane down. 
So at that moment, once they clear down a 4,000, or maybe even 2,000 a little bit later, you really need to get your airplane down as quickly as possible, because you will get initially a 180 knot speed restriction, and then later 165 until 4 nautical miles. So now we're going down, but Stansted wouldn't be Stansted if they wouldn't go like, yeah, reduce speed uh, 180 knots. Okay, 180, flap 5. By reducing the speed, you're just going to get even higher on the glide slope now, as your drag is reducing as well. If you're flying a non-short field aircraft, that is a good moment usually to get flaps 10 out, as the additional drag is going to help you, but you just about have to experiment with what you can and what you cannot do at this point. Using the glide slope is always a very good reference, and initially as you are approaching the center line, you will eventually get 2,500 feet as an altitude clearance and then 2,000 together with the final turn. They really like to turn you in short, so... Why did that autopilot engage now? Come on, please. Thank you. So now we are turning basically towards around about the six miles final. I have no idea why my airplane is overturning. Good job, autopilot. Thank you. And now, what happens again is they start keeping you high. So at this point, once again, we've got to keep the CDA, so let's go vertical speed 500. And usually they're going to clear you down very, very late at this point. So once again, you've done your very best in order to get the airplane onto the glide slope. And then what happens? Well, they don't make you fly that glide slope. They make you go vertical speed because you don't want to level off. And only eventually you will get your clearance down towards 2,000 feet, typically together with the speed restriction and the ILS clearance. So let's go 2,000, level change, 165 until 4 DME. That is what they normally give you. And then we will typically fly a tiny bit faster provided our flap 5 speed is just above that. So for example, 166 definitely works as well. Then again, we have got to use those speed brakes in order to get the airplane down. That is just how it is in Stansted. You need those speed brakes basically all the time. The airspace is so congested that you really are flying in very narrow corridors. And unfortunately, the 737 has a little bit too little drag to follow those corridors perfectly. But that's just what it is, and that's how you've got to follow those things. So now we're cleared for the ILS, approach armed, typically the final vector is very good to get you right onto that um, six mile final, unfortunately my airplane overturned so for that reason I'm just going to correct myself here, typically it will get you straight onto the fox fox point. And when you're cleared there, take it on top so that you get a better Venus profile. Now we can see we're on profile, we can see we're on the glide slope, the banana is just about right. And with that, we are on a way to be established very well. Do use oh, vertical yeah, speed modes. Do use your vertical speed modes over here in order to stay on the glide slope. It might as well happen that they make you intercept from above. So passing 10 mile, I've had my glide slope at uh, one dot below. Happens. It's normal for Stansted, so... Don't be surprised if that happens, it's totally normal. Okay, we've got localizer capture. Romba heading 222. Now the interesting thing that can happen to you over here is that if you have low visibility procedures in force, you want to configure for landing at 5 miles, but ATC is always going to give you those 165 knots until 4 miles, and you really need to fly it because they will be using minimum separation. Makes things interesting. If it happens to you, just extend the landing gear flap 15 at 5 miles and only then dial your speed back. Then the airplane usually is somewhere in the region around 60 knots till 40 and E, and that works out pretty well. Okay, we're established now. And once you're established, typically some 5 miles out, they're going to hand you over to tower with a call sign only. So you're going to check in with Stansted Tower, like this, Stansted Tower on a 3-2 Lima. And that's it. That's all they want to hear. Because 
ATC instance that is typically understaffed. What do I mean with understaffed? I basically mean that they should be using more controllers, so you might only have a tower controller and a ground controller, or even only a tower controller handling the entire airport. Also be aware, a low drag approach is a mandatory in Stansted, so as you can see I am using my um, 4 DME points to get out the landing gear over here. We're doing a flap 30, uh, sorry, a flap 40 landing, so keep that in mind as you slow the airplane down. Okay, a landing checklist, start switches, continues, recall, check, speed brake, arm green light, landing gear down 3 green. Water brake, max, flaps, 40, 40, green light, and the landing lights to go. Now, seeing that we've got such a tight operation over here, they might still send a departure out at this point. You can expect landing clearance very, very late. In the single pilot flight simulator environment, just turn the lights on a little bit earlier. But even in the real-life multi-crew environment, it happened often that we just, well, didn't even get to turn the lights on anymore because we got the landing clearance at like 200 feet. Alright then, here we are, well established, everything looks stable. Now here comes a little specialty of Stansted. The poppy is designed for the 747, so on short final, like this, you get three reds on the poppies, and if you constantly follow the glide slope down, you will even get four reds on the poppies. That is normal, that is totally normal in Stansted. Okay, now I'm going to disconnect the autopilot. And I'll try to land the plane a little bit before the markers. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, 10. Okay, put it right on top, because we want to vacate at that very first high-speed exit, 1,400 meters down the runway. As you can see with Autobrick Max, it works fairly nicely to get that exit. But with Auto Break 3, things might already get quite fuzzy. So really choose your flap setting and your auto brake setting nicely. And obviously, especially in summer when it's hot, you gotta somehow bring that into alignment with a 25 minute turnaround that your airline has most likely planned. Okay, we're off the runway, so let's have a quick look into the taxi chart and what we can expect. First off, the handover to ground usually comes quite late, because they give takeoff clearance to the next one first, and only then, when you're about to, turn, to make the turn onto the taxiways here, they give you the handover. But you've got a whole chart clear of taxiway hotel. So we are right here on the chart, and we've got to stay clear of hotel. You can see this is actually a hotspot there. And then the ground controller is busy, he might be issuing IFR clearances, so eventually, however, you are typically going to get your clearance onto Juliet, going towards the apron. When Romay 2.2 is in use. With Romay 0.4 in use, you would go via hotel. And they would be using Juliet to taxi the aircraft out towards the holding point. But for us, it's going to be Juliet. And then, coming from Europe, we are typically parking Apron Charlie or Apron Delta. So that is what we are going to do today as well. Let's get that airplane on to Juliet. Alright, we are back in the air, and this time we are going to talk about landing on runway 04. So for that, I have quickly set our airplane up, and I'm going to show you what we can expect. Basically, the initial approach is going to be similar to runway 22, all the way down to, well, the way into Abbott. That is where things start differing. So we've also got the Tosma 1 Alpha arrival leading us towards Abbott, and then from Abbott we've got the initial approach runway 04. Let's have a quick look into this, because things are going to get interesting there. And we're going to start on our FMC and on the routing that we can find over here. So basically everything is the same till Abbott. But then you're going to leave Abbott on the radial 085 in Monarch Parkway by basically 8 DME. And then we make a left-hand turn, we follow those altitude restrictions, but ATC is going to erect radar vector us anyway. So, the restrictions are going to become secondary importance, but this is where everything starts getting important. The Brookman's Park DME-9. 
and you have to be by 3000 feet by that point. You can see it on the chart over here. We've got 90 mu BPK below 3000. In the NAV data over here, that one is missing. That's already bad enough. So we'll make sure to enter that. And here's the interesting thing. You've got the Romeo point, which is the 18 DME Brooklyn's Park at 6000. And then you've got exactly nine miles to descend yourself to 3000 feet. But keep in mind, you're going to have tailwind on that part of the flight because you have headwind on the landing on runway 04. So you've got exactly nine miles to lose 3000 feet and you'll have tailwind. And probably they will also make you reduce your speed exactly on this segment. So once we get a bit closer, I'm going to give you some guidance into how the approach is usually flown and what is usually going to happen. In the meantime, a quick word over here on the cating of the runway. Once again, due to high intensity runway operations, we've got to take the first exit. But Papa Romeo is a little bit further away than November Romeo and runway 22. So for that reason, on this runway, we can use flaps 30 or break 3 and it is usually going to give us a good setup to get our plane onto Papa Romeo. Alright, let's go ahead and beam forward a little bit to the point where we are approaching Idacy, and then I'm going to give you some details into how we actually fly this arrival. Just like the other way around, when approaching runway 22, when you're approaching runway 04 and you're about to reach Idacy, you can also expect either a direct towards aft or some radar vectors. For our principles in the simulation, let's take the direct to Abbott, just like we have gotten last time when we approached runway 22. So, aim on to Abbott. ATC is probably going to clear you down, once again a flat out 120, and they really expect you to descend to that level within a reasonable amount of time. However, you can do something like a thousand feet a minute, but you shouldn't do much less when you are flying this part of the route. So. Let's go forward a little bit once again and see what it looks like when you actually reach Abbott or just prior to Abbott. Approaching Abbott and approaching flight level 80. Now this is where things usually get interesting. At this point ATC normally takes us on a radar vector like this, but being in Britain they are going to vector you somewhat along the magenta line. So maybe left turn heading 270, maybe 280, but something like that. Or maybe even 260. Now, it's important for us that we keep the flight plan updated, so we are going to choose a point on the navigation display that corresponds to our actual track, like the Romeo point over there. So, let's take that and execute. And like that we can sort of keep our VNAV up to date. Going into runway 04, a continuous descent is not going to be possible, so for that reason we are leveling off at flight level 80 now, and we are going to maintain this for quite a while, flying straight ahead. So, let me go ahead and turn on time acceleration, and we have to keep in mind, down there is runway 04, the departures are going to go something like this. So, we are basically overflying the departures at the moment, while at the same time, the Luton arrivals and departures are going over us as well, because we need to keep in mind London Luton is just over here as well, or just over here to be exact. The important point over here is that we have that 9 mile ring around Brookman's Park of UR, because that is actually where we can expect ATC to clear us. Okay, so. We are about approaching the extended center line that usually coincides with the descent to altitude 6000 feet and the transition to the local QNH. So this is what we are going to do. We'll maintain our 245 knots for now because ATC will normally instruct us to maintain a given speed here. Unless there's really no traffic around, then you might get free speed as well. If you get that free speed, then try the following. You want to keep your airspeed under tactical use. What that exactly means is that you want to start slowing down as you approach the 6000 feet and as you approach the 9 miles prior to Brookman's Park. The reason for that is that once you're over here you will have to do the very very steep descent. Right now I should probably exit the real weather because we don't want because we don't want the headwind over here, because normally it would be tailwind on that sector. Unfortunately, since I loaded a safe flight, the simulator doesn't let me do that. Well, so what? 
So approaching 6,000, we can wind our speed back now, awaiting the next clearance down from ATC. We can actually use the speed brakes for this, because it is going to be a very steep descent ahead. And the slower you are, the faster you can take the flaps out by the time we actually get our descent to reach 3000 by Brooklyn Park DME 9. Also quickly go to local Q&H, like this. Okay, left turn heading 220, descent 3000 level by Brooklyn Park DME 9. That is typically what ATC would give you here. Now things start getting interesting. So, typically at this point, we can now start our descent. Oops, I accidentally hit that uh, trim button, my apologies. So we can now start our way down. And the interesting thing over here is we've got the Brooklyn Park 9 in our FMC, so we know which vertical speed we need. But we also know which flight path angle that coincides to. So you will see that by the time we are stable on our speed again, the range to altitude arc is going to get awfully close to that Brooklyn's Park DME 9. In some occasions, ATC go even gives us a speed restriction now and asks us to slow down. When that happens, I would ask them if they want us to slow down or go down first. Normally they say go down first, then start slowing down. So this is what we'll do in the purpose of this video. Note that I've accelerated to 240 knots there, so theoretically we'll take, we could take the flaps out. However, I would reduce the speed to 230 before I actually do that, because the flap limit speed is going to be 250 knots. We've got 1000 to go. But in this particular case, since we really need to be leveled by Brooklyn Park 9, I'm just going to keep the high vertical speed on the way down, they will not have other traffic below us in this particular situation anyway. Okay, reaching Brookmouth Park 9. As soon as it goes into Alta Choir, I'll start winding the speed back because chances are we'll get the base turn very, very soon. So, speed coming back. Speed brake back in. Keep the engines in idle for as long as you can. And you can basically expect your base turn a beam the Fox Fox 04. So in about two nautical miles latest, I would expect to get the uh, base turn. And for that reason, let's go flap one and start preparing ourselves for that little turn. Keep in mind, this ring over here is the 10 mile ring. So you can see we are still well within the um, 10 nautical mile ring around Stansted Airport over here. Okay, starting the left turn. At this point, normally cleared down 2,500 feet as well. So let's go vertical speed, 500 feet a minute. What's really important now, as you start the base turn over here, is that you do the frisk check correctly and make sure that you get to see the correct ILS frequency. So we've got India Sierra Echo Delta over here. And that actually matches our runway in question. Because runway 22 and runway 04 are using the same localizer. So that, or rather the same frequency, my apologies. Okay then, flaps 5, slow it down further. And we can start our final turn, heading 070. Often they make you descend 2000 feet in this situation as well. And here we go. Make sure you don't overshoot, use the bank angle selector as needed, and then we can arm our approach mode. And we can use vertical speed to try and achieve a continuous descent over here. You don't have to, because the approach isn't going to be a CDA anyway. Okay, here we are, established, and once again this is Stansted, so you will get 165 knots until 4 DME, and that is exactly what we've established already making our life a little bit easier. From here on, flight of capture. 3000 feet set. So from here on the approach is going to be pretty similar to the approach to Rome 22. Keep in mind we got to vacate on the first high speed turn off. And a little difference there compared to what we had earlier. This time when we vacate the runway via Papa Romeo, 
we will most likely taxi via hotel, as in Runway 04 operations, they mostly use hotel for inbound and Juliet for outbounds. So that's just something to keep in mind, but in any case, we need an ATC clearance in order to turn ourselves onto that taxiway. Okay, got a bit of tailwind here. Let's start configuring. Gear down, flap 15. Flap 25, just to help myself to slow the airplane down, because we're still pretty close to the... Um, Maximum speed limit for uh, flap 30. Okay, looks good. Flap 30, VR of plus 5. And that is all we need. Okay, landing checklist, start switches, continuous, recall, check, speed brake, arm crew light, landing it down 3 green, auto brake reset, flaps. 30, 30, green light, landing lights, on, landing checks complete. Okay, disconnecting the autopilot, let's have a little bit of fun and bring the airplane right down. Bit of tailwind here, forgive me for that, um, unfortunately since I loaded a safe flight the simulator didn't let me, um, the simulator didn't let me just recover my, um, weather scenario that I had prepared. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. Okay, right onto the marker. Manual brakes. Auto brake disarm. And this is the exit we're aiming for. And once again, we will probably get the hand off to ground rather late, and we must not enter a taxiway hotel, but we must vacate the runway completely, so the entire airplane needs to go beyond the line over here. Only when the entire airplane is beyond that line, they can have the next airplane touchdown or take off. So, you will kind of be stuck over here and try to do it without stopping the airplane. So now, standard taxi routing is over here onto hotel, and then via hotel we are going to get towards the terminal, just like we did on our landing on Romay 22. So for that reason, let's hop over to our Romay 22 scenario once again, and I'll show you the rest of the taxi in. But once you're a Juliet, you typically get taxi, taxi Juliet, and then either Hotrod, Apron Zulu, Hotrod, Apron Alpha, Alpha, and so on. So that's typically how things look like going into Stansted. So you'll get those Hotrods of the um, aprons now i'm quickly going to tidy my airplane up over here i'll keep the charts open for you because we will need them again okay and here we are so what's next up is going to be taxi into the apron and here things get interesting once again. First of all, calls and confusion obviously is a big threat on the arrival. Because, especially when you're flying Ryanair, but also when you're flying Jet 2, you will have a lot and a lot of company aircraft next to you. Over here is the um, first part of the cargo apron, so you would typically see FedEx parking over here. And then when you're entering apron Alpha, you have the cargo center over here. So gate 1 through 9 are going to be used for example by UPS. Always great when you're taxiing in over here and you see those UPS 747 standing there, the FedEx MD-11s on apron Zulu and so on. But back to our interesting stuff. The most interesting gate to park at certainly is 4-5 right because well you're gonna see it when we taxi past it. And the other thing that you need to be aware of is that usually we are using the taxi lanes west or east. The middle line is basically not used. In real life, they substitute the taxi assignments by turning stop bars on. So you would have stop bars all along the way. And typically they would guide you with a stop bar onto the correct taxi line. When you're driving on those taxi lines, it is very important 
to actually use the exact center line. So if we have a look into this, we can put one airplane on the west line, another on the east line, and provided those are medium category Charlie aircraft, like the 737 and A320, you would normally have about two meters of wingtip clearance. So wingtip clearance is a big point on that one. So be very sure that you are taxiing carefully on the center line. Once again, we are approaching an area like this, and you can see over here, we've got the west line coming first, and this actually tells us maximum 737 or A321. So that's the west line. Then we've got the center line, the middle one, and then we've got the east line. So we've got to be very careful to actually pick the correct taxi line for our operation. Okay, coming up is stand 45 right. And you can see why this is the interest, most interesting one to taxi into. You will have an airplane parking here, you will have an airplane parking here. You have equipment standing here and you have that light pole. So it's very easy to, to break your wingtip when taxiing into this stand. And obviously whenever you're doing simulator training, you will be parking on this stand. Okay, the 45s, in my experience, are mostly used for UK flights, just like the 30s. And then the um, higher 45s, so the ones closer to the terminal over here, the 50s over here, and then the 60s over there, are typically going to be used for European flights, at least in terms of the Ryanair operation. Okay, let's flick on that APU. Do note, when you're going to the 50s or the 60s, the apron is going upwards a little bit, so you might want to reconsider if you really want to do single-engine taxi before you've turned onto the apron. Especially so, because you need to use minimum thrust to get your airplane moving because of all the equipment standing nearby. Finally, over here, we've got the 70s and the 80s. Those are typically used to park empty aircraft, but they are typically not used for passenger flights. So, you really often hear tucks that are going to pull airplanes from there somewhere to the passenger stands over here before those airplanes are then being used. Okay, we have found our way. The final thing to talk about here is the gate assignments. So we've got 63 left, 63 right, and basically all the gates are assigned. You've got a center gate, 63, and then you've got a left and a right. In those medium aircraft, like the 737s or the A320s, you will normally park on a left or a right stand, never on the center stand. Because, as you can see, the center stands would block two gates, while using the left and the right stands, you can put two aircraft on one gate. And that is what they aim to do over here, to make operation more efficient. So let's say we're going to go into 6-2 right, Be very sure that everything is clear of personnel over here. Indie builds got rather little ground clutter in the scenery. In real life, there can be a lot more. Typically, you would have the ground power unit standing here, you'd have staff standing over here, the fuel truck might be there as well, or it might never come, both can happen. And that way, you are just going to follow the guidance system. Very important, if the guidance is not on, do not turn onto the stand. In the simulator, well, we don't need to talk about it. But in real life, if the guidance is not on, or if it shows fail or wait, then do not turn onto the stands. Okay then, here we are. And we've made it. Typically, they are very, very good with the ground power here in Stansted. So, you arrive on block, a second later they connect with the ground power unit, and then you don't even need the APU. For the simulator purposes, I prefer using the APU, and that's gonna be it. Welcome to London Stansted Airport. So, I'm very eager to look forward to your feedback on a detailed tutorial about an airport like this one. Do let me know if you like this one, and leave a like, comment, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so yet. I am very much looking forward to your feedback. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching, and I see you all again on the next one.